Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Ab Haas, and with me here is Team 18270, the Robo Players from Irvine, Texas. They are currently ranked number one in the world by non-penalty OPR, second in auto, eighth in teleop, and hold your top two world record scores. Robo Players is just insane every season, and Decode is no exception. I can't wait to jump into their intake, take a super deep dive into that very fast spin dexter, super accurate shooter, all that, and more coming up on this Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Take on the decode season with Studica Robotics, featuring their FTC starter bot, new six millimeter hex shaft and motor options and updated bevel gears. FTC teams can receive a 25% discount and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and front runners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. All right, Robo players. So first question for you guys is, I think every season speed is like the biggest focus from you guys. And so the spin dexter was a little bit of a surprise to me because I would have expected going for more of a direct transfer robot just so you could shoot very quickly. Why did you decide to go with the spin dexter design? Yeah, so we wanted our robot design to basically stay the same throughout the season uh, because we wanted to prove one design worked and then basically just stick with that. Um, so we decided to do spin dexter because we thought like pattern um, like would be necessary, especially late in the game, because the threshold for the ranking point is like it's set to change. So uh, right now it's only nine. Um, and if you shoot randomly, you're basically able to get that. But we wanted to be able to get it like consistently. Uh, so we knew that indexing would probably be a good idea. Um, and we just thought like spin dexter is the simplest. Um, and we tested this on like a version one robot and it's worked pretty well so we just stuck with it and used it on the V2. Awesome. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. You know, future proofing your robot is always a good idea, um, given like some some season formats. So let's let's start with the intake. If you guys can give us a close up shot of how it looks like when you're collecting those artifacts, that'd be great. And then we'll jump into uh, some questions on that front. I see I see you guys have those boot wheels on the sides. So, uh, you know, how much did those guys did those help? And what did you guys have there before you tried those? So I think that boot wheels actually helps a lot with um, in taking artifacts that aren't directly uh, in the path of the gecko wheels, especially along with these wedges, they really help um, in take artifacts a lot. And then so before this, we only had gecko wheels on our version one, and we found that it's difficult to intake artifacts, for example, on the corner of the field. So what we did was um, add these on the side, so we can get yeah. this. And if we can if we can see a couple of cycles, maybe first having an artifact directly through the center through those gecko wheels, and then another artifact placed on the sides, that would be really, really excellent. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. Great, so we saw a lot of action. We're gonna jump into that spin dexter now. Uh, is there any sensors you guys have along that ramp into your spin dexter that, that aid in the whole automations behind that mechanism? Uh, we have a color sensor basically exactly where the ball comes up. So right underneath um, this plate here is a uh, brass color sensor V3. Um, and we mainly just use it to track like whenever a ball is there. So we just have a distance threshold. Uh, and then whenever a ball is detected, it just goes to the next index. Awesome. Yeah, and I've noticed teams talk a lot about uh, how they have had to place two color sensors in order to make sure they don't uh, shoot through the holes in the artifact. Was that not an issue you guys have had? We just took multiple readings and we just uh, averaged the readings out so we were able to get an accurate measurement. Awesome. Yeah, as, as far as like averaging readings and taking multiple readings go, are your loop times an important consideration there? And if so, how fast are you running your loops? Yeah, we only uh, read the distance for the vast majority of times. Only whenever we detect for the first time, we run five sensor calls and then it's only for one loop that we actually read the color. Okay, okay, got it. Makes makes a ton of sense. Now, jumping into your spin dexter, why don't you start by giving us an overview of the mechanism, what you have going on there, and then have a bunch of specific questions. Yeah, so the main part of the spin dexter is our big gear. So we have a, a gear out the very edge, which is powered at the back. And so this allows us to pretty much keep the bottom open and the bottom of the below the, the space below the spin dexter needs to be very free. And this basically allows us to spin pretty fast because it's using a motor. 
Yeah, so there's actually a bear motor here at the back. Um, so it's just a nine tooth uh, gear on the bear motor. Uh, so the end RPM is about like 170 ish. Okay, yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And why did you guys decide to go with that bear motor instead of a servo uh, or you know a higher RPM motor to start with? Yeah, a servo. We tried a servo with our V1, and we found it was really slow. Uh, even with a motor, we still think that it's slightly limiting our speed that we shoot at. But with this speed, it's it, it it's fast enough where it, it it's manageable. Awesome. Yeah, and then talking a little bit about those speeds, can you quantify a little bit of that performance? Like, wh how long does it take to index between those artifacts right now? Uh, it takes us around one and a half seconds to fully shoot all three balls. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's limited from like a software PID perspective, or do you think you are just running that system as fast as it can go, uh, and you're going to need something else if you want to go faster? Yeah, I think the biggest performance bottleneck is probably the way whenever we index, it's our kicker having to go up and then down again. So yeah. every time we try to shoot a ball, we have to, uh, we, have, we, have to we have to we have to the kick, the kicker needs to go up and then back down before it's indexed to the next slot. So this is our main speed bottleneck. I see. And talking a little bit about that large gear unit, motor pinion, totally understand. As far as fabrication for that large gear goes, did you guys just print it in multiple sections or is it 3D printed or not 3D printed? Talk about that yeah. a little bit. The, the gear is made out of aluminum from Fabworks. Okay. And so it's just a single unibody piece uh, that goes yeah. across the yeah. entire. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Now, talking a little bit about managing the artifacts in the Spindexer, uh, have you had to, like, are there any spe special considerations with adding, like, walls or blockers in specific locations so that they really hold uh, their position and don't uh, move around too much? Uh, we didn't really have any problems, with, like, moving around because we have, like, a, a decent amount of, like, funneling through the intake. So it doesn't really matter too much there. Um, we just added these walls here on the side so that it like doesn't get jammed as it's going through the intake or like out into the shooter. Awesome. Uh, one more thing about that Spindexer is localization. Do you guys have additional sensors or how do you know where the Spindexer is at all times? Yeah, we have an absolute encoder at the bottom right here. And okay. it's not connected to the motor in any way. So even if the, the Spindexer gear skips, it's perfectly fine. Very cool. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. That's ingenious. Now, talking about that uh, kicker you guys have going on, uh, walk me through some of the iterations you guys went and how you really made it super, super consistent. Yeah, so um, our kicker probably had the most iterations like on our entire bot, um, just because there were like so many variables to tune. So um, it, right now, it's just two go the super speeds running at six volts. Um, so it's decently fast, probably like the fastest that you can get, um, like without gearing it up or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that we had to make sure is that um, the kicker had to move up like as little as possible. Um, but like as it was turning, the ball shouldn't go up that much because the spin deck can move so fast that sometimes the ball would get stuck up here. Um, so we had to make sure that like it was moving as little as possible, but not getting the ball stuck. So I see you guys actually have the artifact move up on its own naturally a little bit before your kicker kicks it all the way up into the shooter. Is that something like you guys added uh, after or was that there from day one with the design? It, it, it was just a feature of the way our kicker works. Uh, mm -hmm. If we just try to have a flat kicker piece without the, the bump, mm -hmm. we weren't actually able to get it high. We weren't, we weren't able to get the artifact high enough to actually touch the wheel. So we mm -hmm. added this bump, which just had the effect of moving back a little bit, but it's not really significant in any way. I see, I see. Okay, now talking about your shooter, uh, let's start with just the numbers. You know, how many motors are you running and what RPM do you typically shoot at? Yeah, uh, we run at uh, two bare motors mm -hmm. and we, we normally run, it depends on where we shoot at, but we run anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 RPM. Awesome, and let's let's look at those wheels. I think those are the hogback wheels or what are you running yeah. there? Yeah, we're running three hogback wheels just to give us increased inertia. Awesome. And as far as like, um, did, did you start with just one wheel and then add the other two or have you always had the three there on the shooter? Yeah, we originally started off with one and then we added the other two on the side just in case the moment of inertia. Mm -hmm. And talking a little bit about spin up time and you know drop time between shots, what does that look like for you guys? Uh, the spin up time is, is it, it isn't that big. It's like two seconds maximum. 
and we weren't actually able to notice the drop in velocity. Yeah, yeah because like that's not really the limiting factor for us. Mm -hmm. By the time like the spin exo turns, it's already back up. Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't matter too much. Yeah. I see. I see. Very cool. And uh, talking a little bit about compression, is that something you guys have had to tune a lot throughout the season, or did you find a number and just stick stuck with it? Uh, we tuned it up. We tuned it a little bit, but it was just like we got around like the second attempt. We okay. just have a the compression. Oh, sorry. What what compression are you running? Seven millimeters. Seven millimeters. Wow. So yeah, we've seen a lot of different ranges from teams somewhere around like the two, three millimeter range, and you guys are at the seven. Uh, d did you guys start with something less or more, and then how did it change? Yeah, we started off with way more. It was like okay. 12, 13, and we found that it was really like, we, we our shooter dropped a lot of velocity, and we didn't really want that to happen that much. Like we, we, we were able to notice it even with the spin dexter. So we just uh, increased or decreased the, uh, the, the like the compression and yeah we, we settled on the seven millimeters and it just worked fine for us makes a ton of sense now talking a little bit about your hood i see you know we've seen a lot of like rack and pinion designs but you guys have gone for more of a linkage why go with that design and what are the strengths of it yeah a linkage just packages better for us it's it's easier than using a multi-turn servo so and it's also faster so mm -hmm. that's just those are the reasons why we just did it yeah, as far as like rigidity, have you seen increased or decreased rigidity because of that linkage uh, acting as a backstop, or what has that done for you? Uh, we don't really have any rigidity problems on our link on our hood because we're using like the actual we're using bearings over here and here, so mm -hmm. they're not really there's there's not really much backlash. So why mount your limelight directly to the hood? Yeah, so originally when we wanted. To uh, to, to track the gold using the lime, uh, using the limelight, we we realized that whenever we're far away, we, it needs to be more horizontal. So going up like this would be better. And whenever we're closer to the gold, we need to be facing more up. So that's just the reason why we did something like this. I see. And talking about shooter consistency, I think your guys' biggest strength is the consistency with which you shoot from the far launch zone. What do you think is the secret sauce behind that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just because we have like velocity PID on our shooter, uh, it keeps it at a relatively constant speed. Uh, and then also we try to shoot like directly. Uh, we we try to hit back. the back of the goal. So that way okay. we don't hit the metal at the bottom. It doesn't bounce out. Mm -hmm. And as far as like, uh, you know, PID thresholds, you're never going to have like exactly perfect, uh, like zero error. So what are those error bounds looking like for you guys? Did you have to tune those a lot or yeah, what are you setting those up? Um, our air bounds are like plus or minus 20 ticks. There's, they're, they're more whenever it's, we're at far and they're less when we're at close, but mm -hmm. we, we didn't really find that to be much of an issue because since we're hitting straight at the back of the goal, the, the exact velocity, we have more of a give with our velocity. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And uh, talking about the turret you have there, is that, uh, I see the large uh, pinion for the servo, I assume, but is that servo based or is that another motor for the turret? Yeah, it's a single axon. Okay, yeah, so it's an Axon Mini. It's a two-stage production. Okay, so are in the at the end of the day, are you turning uh, just like once on the Axon Mini, or are you running it in continuous rotation mode? Uh, we're we're setting it in servo mode, and we're setting it to the position that the pinpoint gives. Like like we're doing, we're getting the p position of the pinpoint, and then we're calculating the angle that the turn needs to move, and we're just setting that as the position. Mm -hmm. We don't run the pinpoint ourselves. Okay, and as far as the turret stack is concerned, uh, like the bearing stack, what are you using for that main bearing? We're just using the, uh, the West Coast Products X Contact, the six inch bear. Okay, okay, makes sense. Now talking a little bit about automation uh, and software, when you have the artifacts stored uh, inside the robot, how do you decide uh, for the motif where to score? Uh, in Telia, we have the ability for the driver to shoot, like we, we can shoot a green ball, we can shoot a purple ball, but Normally, we don't usually use that because it's uh, if, if we get the ranking point in auto, there's no need to do the motif again in Telecom. Hmm. Okay, so is it just like, you know, one button to shoot a purple, one button to shoot a green, you don't have to like, it doesn't automatically decide which one? Yeah, so, sometimes when we miss, we don't want that to actually become a problem and hmm. we just just have the precision on exactly when we shoot one. That, that, that makes a ton of sense. Looking to the future with this design, do you see the ability to add like double parking features or is that something that's not really something you're envisioning with this robot? Yeah, this robot is actually, uh, not right now, it's not capable of double park, but we have the space for it. I'm gonna show it right here. So we have the space to like lift up the bot like this. Mm -hmm. uh, show it from the top. So right here, there's a space 
for us to uh th- there's a space oh. for us huh yeah there's a space for us to add a place that would push down on the floor so that mm-hmm. way it's, it's like uh tilting the bot using a linear rail okay okay very cool yeah I mean, Robo players, thank you guys so much. I think one last question is is driver practice. What does driver practice look like for you guys? How often are you doing it? And what do you do that makes you so much more competitive than other teams? Uh, we just try to get basically as much driver practice as possible. Um, so just basically whenever we have time, because we're a community team, uh, we can just like work in the garage and then just get a bunch of drive practice. So we just try to do as much as possible, basically. Okay. As far as like strategy during driver practice goes, what does that look like? Are you running drills? Are you running full batches? Are you putting obstacles on the field? Tell me about that. Uh, it, it's more just like continuous scoring. We don't do too many full matches. Uh, it's just like straight up scoring balls. So we can um, get like a variety of placements of balls because throughout a match, uh, the balls aren't like in one specific place. It's more scattered throughout the field. Uh, and probably the best way to simulate that is just by not running full matches, just like running like a long a five lot. minutes. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, Robo players, thank you guys so much. I'm so glad we could do this. You guys have just the best Findexer we've seen so far this season, and you're the number one team in the world right now. So huge congratulations uh, to that and reporting for Fun Robotics Network. I'm Ab Haas, and this is Team 18270, the Robo players. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and frontrunners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. Take on the decode season with Studica Robotics, featuring their FTC starter bot, new 6mm hex shaft and motor options, and updated bevel gears. FTC teams can receive a 25% discount and apply for grants at studica.com robots.